How many times have you been intrigued by something that doesn't make any sense? How many times have you been fascinated by an illusion? And how many times have you struggled and struggled to solve a problem? Each time you've been experiencing curiosity. Rob? Television is accused of turning people into couch potatoes, of making them passive instead of active. But television can be a very powerful way of engaging curiosity and the drive to satisfy it. The 1970s and the 1980s are regarded as the golden years of Australia's television. And during those two decades, uh, we were um, engaged in turning people, um, using television into encouraging curiosity. Curiosity Show was the name of uh, of our program. And it was largely a science program uh, with a lot of making and doing, using everyday materials around the home. We've recently been in encouraged, in fact, uh, commissioned to make a new program on food science using the same kind of approach. But uh, although we hope there's going to be more, that's in the future. Let's now go back 40 years into the past, and you will notice we have not changed a bit. <laughs> <laughs> Watch the tip of the funnel as the QE2 circumnavigates the Earth. Here it is. Leaves the harbour, goes all the way around, and the tip of the funnel is making a larger circle than the rest of the boat, so it actually goes further. Ah, oh, I see what you mean. Yes, I suppose it does. Well, on that basis, there's a part of the boat that goes even further. Really? Mm. I wonder what part that is. The first hand grabs the opposing cork. No trouble there. Yes. But the thumb of the second hand doesn't grab the outer part. It ducks through the hole and grabs the inside end of the cork. Ah. Then this hand, this finger reaches round outside and they come apart like that. I Have a go. I think I've got it. Hallo und willkommen zur Curiosity Show. Wir haben schon oft von Seemannsknoten gesprochen, aber wisst ihr auch, was das ist? Bestimmt wisst ihr das. Aber falls manche von euch nicht wissen, wie man einen knöpft, dann zeige ich es euch. Gummiaufsatz benutzen. I should have explained, Nehmen wir mal an, ich we were broadcast in Australia and 15 other countries. Nehmen wir so an die Wange setzen und anfangen die Kurbel zu drehen. Und abgesehen davon, dass das Sprechen irgendwie schwer fällt und dass man alles doppelt sieht, wäre es eine Massage oder sowas ähnliches. Well, why did Curiosity Show begin? Back in the 1960s and early 70s, children's television focused mainly on preschoolers. But then a new regulation was brought in by the Australian Federal Government to tell all networks, commercial networks, that they must produce a certain amount of programming for older children and broadcast it out of school hours. So Curiosity Show evolved from Here's Humphrey, a preschool program featuring Humphrey B. Bear. So in the early days, our colleague was a big brown non-speaking bear wearing that uh, straw boater and tartan waistcoat. My experience in television actually started as a scriptwriter and presenter on schools programs on the ABC, the Australian Broadcasting Commission. But then, uh, besides doing that, I was asked to present science segments for the Nine Network on Here's Humphrey. Wow. I remember once Humphrey standing alongside me, picking up a rubber mallet and smashing live cockroaches, which I was showing on camera. Fortunately, the, tape, the show was being taped and I had some spare insects, so we redid that segment, this time with Humphrey behaving himself. Well, I also got my start on ABC educational television. And um, one day I was uh, invited on to, uh, here's Humphrey, to talk about uh, hand rearing a little possum that I was raising. And I did, and I was astounded to be rung the next day and offered the job of presenter of this new Curiosity program that was going to be started, because I was so relaxed on camera. Well, 
Uh, ABC, I might say, had this wonderful laconic business of talk-throughs and rehearsals and multiple takes. And uh, so I agreed to do this, but I did have the wit not to tell them that in Humphrey, I thought what, what I thought was the first leisurely talk through was in fact the one and only final take. No wonder I was relaxed on camera. <laughs> but I then became, I think, the only person to get Humphrey Bear ever to talk on television. I brought in a lot of scientific equipment to address the, to address the set. And one of these items was a Van de Graaff generator used in science centres to generate <laughs> Uh, 50,000 volts of static electricity and make children's <laughs> hair stand on end, which it does. Well, um, Humphrey was always upstaging us because he couldn't talk. He'd go around pointing at everything like this. And he pointed just a bit too closely at the Van de Graaff generator. <laughs> there was a crack like a pistol shot, an arc of blue fire about a metre long leapt into the outstretched digit of this unhappy bear. He did a quick 360 from the depths of this muffled suit. You just heard one single emphatic muffled profanity. <laughs> Most inappropriate for a children's program, but shortly after that, we got rid of the bear to my delight, and Curiosity Show began to emerge in its own right. So what made Curiosity Show different? Well, in 1968, a Scottish educator called Roderick Maclean wrote a fascinating little book called Television in Education. And what he said in that book is, if you're working in television, regardless of whether it's news, sport, entertainment, or education, you have the same basic four fundamental capacities that you're using. And they are the ability for television to manipulate size, to manipulate time, to control your point of view, and also to assemble material from various sources. Back in 1972, when uh, Curiosity Show began, television was black and white, and digital technology didn't exist. Educational television consisted of a televised classroom. We wanted something different from that, so we decided we are going to exploit these four capacities of television in every segment we designed. Now, that was back then. But then, uh, what we found out, of course, is that in designing things for television, uh, you need to anticipate how the children might react to these things. And so what we did is to... Uh, uh, these, these capacities of television uh, may be common now, but 40 years ago they were not. So let's have a look at some of the examples of things that we did on the Curiosity Show in designing segments to go into the program. First of all, manipulating size. You can take something like a tiny insect and expand it to fill a large screen. You can take the solar system and shrink it to fill that same screen. We frequently used uh, extreme close-ups as hooks to grab the attention of the viewer. Let's have a look at some of these. That is a lever that will enable you to see my pulse. On top of the spot where I could feel my pulse. I think that's it. Yes, it is. Look at that. You are actually seeing my pulse shoots off very quickly. It can fill its body with water and squirt it out the back end. Switch it on again, pick it up, move it across, drop it. You see, just on the end there, there's a little hard lump that they can knock against the branch or each other with. There we go, like that. See if you can predict what will happen and then see if you're right. Here comes the flame underneath. Watch it carefully. You can see what it's doing. The end of it is bending up. I've got two matches with square rigged sails on them. Put one in there and one in there, much like the boat that you saw. I'm going to use a straw so you can see the direction that the wind is coming from. In this case, it's behind the boat, which scoots off very effectively indeed. Now watch the rice grains as I turn the volume up. Now the second capacity of television, manipulating time. We can show things in real time, in quick motion, slow motion, or freeze frame. And uh, a couple of examples where we've used slow motion replays to explain what they've just seen in real time. <laughs> I think that's a lot of energy being released. Just look at it in slow motion. Imagine what happens in a real nuclear reaction. Not 19, but millions of uranium atoms all releasing their energy. A huge chain reaction. Yes. On goes the egg. 
<laughs> and in it goes with a resounding pop. As soon as Recent the flame dragon. went out, air inside the bottle started to cool, it contracted, less pressure inside, more pressure outside, atmospheric pressure pushed the egg in. Third capacity of television, controlling viewpoint. You can give every person the ideal position, front row, centre. You can show things from a low angle, from a high angle, an objective view or over the uh, presenter's shoulder with a subjective view and by controlling viewpoint very often you can create illusions which are fascinating. Here are some examples where we are controlling your viewpoint. An old pack of cards. How does it work? Well, I'm glad you asked. We just happen to have a model of that temple right here. We put it underneath the altar and slowly but surely intriguing things happen and the door opens. How did that work? Well, I tell you what, why don't you come around behind me and maybe you can figure it out for yourself. Uh, because behind the cardboard box, oh, there you are. Bring our rings in there, sit them right on the middle or else they'll fly off into space and you won't get any illusion at all. It'll spin and at the fastest speed, you'll get the illusion of the spinning rings. But what's your brain going to tell you about the window? Will your brain allow you to see the window going around in a circle will the, with the pen? Or are you going to see something really strange? Well, have a look at that. That's unbelievable, isn't it? You can see the pen going around in a circle, but your brain is telling you that the window is going part way around and turning and going the other way. An amazing illusion, the Ames window. And I think you're going to have a lot of fun making your own. And the fourth capacity of television assembling material, in this example, Rob explains hieroglyphics using a painting, using stencils, drawings, animation, voice, and sound effects. Hieroglyphics. Symbol, which makes it complex, because they could be objects or ideas or sounds. A lotus plant for a thousand, two cores of rope for the hundreds, three cattle hobbles, and four strokes. And they had hieroglyphics for fractions as well, very important for dividing up parcels of grain or the land that it grew on. Bit odd until you put them all together and then the whole story changes because together they make almost the symbol of Egypt, the eye of the sun god Horus. Well, how well did it all work? Um, television, like anything powerful, can have powerful effects for good or bad. We wanted our effect to be encouraging activity with children, and curiosity was the key. We gave them segments on technology, on natural history. We used science and maths dressed up as magic tricks. We showed the science behind art and music and a lot more. And we tried to make bridges between these things and deal with the science of everyday life and leave children with something to do, something to make, or something to explore. And in many thousands they did, either at home or in school, where very often Curiosity Show was used as a single science lesson of the week. Science is timeless. Scientific phenomena now are as interesting as they were hundreds of years ago. And it's also ages, so we found that our audience was not just children, it is stretched far beyond the children for whom the program was made. And so we've brought it back. We now have our own uh, Curiosity Show YouTube channel. And in many ways it's... Thank you. Thank you. It's subscribe. You'll get our newsletter. <laughs> but in many ways, it's better for our material than broadcast television because you can pause it, you can replay it instantly. You couldn't do that with broadcast television, not at least until video recording came in. But it's ideal if you're trying to follow how to make or do something. And we've only been going for about a year, but already we're finding again that there are these thousands of children who really want to have this interactive relationship with the world around them and equally many thousands of parents who want more science in their children's lives. We're delighted when we hear stories of people who were inspired by the Curiosity Show. A couple of years ago I met Stacy Borg, a CSIRO scientist working on the Australian Synchrotron project. He's consumed by science and he told me that that started from when he used to watch Curiosity Show. Recently I met Sam Hodge from, the, uh, uh, from a film production company in Adelaide. Sam was the computer graphics supervisor for the Oscar-winning film Gravity. And he told me that he's working in that multidisciplinary area that involves science, technology, and art because of the Curiosity Show. 
Scores of other people tell us similar stories. Of course, it, it can be a bit daunting when some bald middle-aged bloke totters up to you and says, I used to watch you when I was young. <laughs> <laughs> but, but did we really turn people on to science? Um, I'm not sure. Um, educators across Australia are really worrying about the turnoff of science and maths in schools, and they're wondering what they can do about it, how they can turn children onto science. In my experience, you don't have to. Children love dinosaurs and volcanoes and rocks and minerals and tricks and puzzles and inventions. They are already turned onto science, but something is turning them off, and we need to know what it is. Uh, I think one contender could be peer pressure. If you're a child who likes music or theater or sport, then any newspaper, any radio or television newscast will immediately tell you that you're on the right track. Millions of people share your interest and it's part of popular culture. But say you're interested in science, you'll be called a nerd or a dweeb or a dork, and I think peer pressure being what it is among the young, that may be sufficient for some delicate souls to suppress their interest in order to fit in. I think Curiosity Show gave them some affirmation that there are others like them who like this stuff and encourage them to persist with it. So we may have brought some to science. I'd like to think we stopped others being turned off it. But before we go, we need a couple of quick volunteers, and we'll do some science with you before volunteers. we Volunteers. Hello, your name? Clara. Clara's going to help me. Come on this side, Clara. This is just a bit of ordinary paper, isn't it? Okay. I want you to hold on to that. Put it into my rollers here, mm -hmm. in there, very square, very square, and I'm going to trap it in. This is like using clothes and a mangle, but Dean and I are probably the only people who can remember mangle. <laughs> So we wind that in, let it go. Okay, that's grinding through the rollers, isn't it? And it's going to start to come out the front. Okay, make sure it comes out. Going through, coming out. Oh, it's changed. <laughs> Grab hold of it. Grab hold of it. And that's yours, because I've got some bigger bits of paper. I'm going out the back to make myself some 50s. <laughs> Thank you, Clara. <laughs> Dean. Now, your name is? Stefan. Stefan. Stefan, when I was a 10-year-old, I went along to see a magician at a theatre. He did some amazing tricks and said that it was all magic. Realised later it was science. He did this. Tablecloth, bowl of fruit, cup and saucer, vase of flowers, <laughs> grabbed hold of the tablecloth on one side and pulled it. The tablecloth came away and everything else stayed there. Should we get Stefan to try this? Yeah. Practice run first, Stefan. Uh, well, imagine you've got a table in front of you there. Grab the tablecloth on the corner. Yeah. Ready, set. Go! Okay, speed and follow through. And beat the Now clock. for the real thing. Grab it from the corner there. You want to stand back a bit with your camera, <laughs> sir. Okay. Ready, set, go! <laughs> he did it. Give him a round of applause. For you, Stefan. And one, well, one for the lady. There's the classroom, television, the internet, social media. We don't know what's going to come next. All these are powerful technologies, but whatever will come next will be equally powerful in its effect for good or bad. Whatever the next big thing happens to be, we can be sure that there'll be increasing opportunities to stimulate curiosity. And from curiosity comes activity, creativity and learning. And increasingly, the learner will be in charge. Thank you. Thank you.